Thank you for another opportunity to fellowship and meet with the saints that we can come and encounter your word. The word that challenges us, the word that teaches us, the word that guides us and leads us. And Father, we invite your Holy Spirit now to invade this place. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes, and let us be able to hear what the Spirit would say. Holy Spirit, I ask that you stir the gift that's on the inside of me and use me as your preacher and your teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, over the past few weeks, I have spent more than a few hours looking at our Constitution and bylaws in the church. And the second article for article of our Constitution Bible discusses Mountain Grove's purpose, and it reads as follows, Article 2, Purpose, 2.1, our purpose is reaching the loss, restoring the wounded, and nurturing and developing the saints. So over the next few weeks, we will be talking about these three points. As we have discussed the past two weeks, the most important thing that we can do as we begin our race is to prepare and turn our focus to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The picture that we're giving here in Hebrews chapter 12 is a picture of a race. But this race is not a sprint. This is not the 100-yard dash or the 100-meter race that's in the Olympics. This is more like a marathon, a race that is over a great distance, a race of endurance. And as we carefully read the scripture, you realize that this race is actually a relay race. Hebrews 12 is a continuance of thought from chapter 11. And when you go back and look in chapter 11, the scripture shares with us so many examples of the great heroes of faith. We see stories of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and many more. All of them looking toward the hope of seeing the promise of a Messiah, but none of them got to experience that promise. Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 through 40 says, And all of these, speaking of all the saints that come before, have, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. They ran a race and now have passed the baton onto us so that now we can run the race that is set before us, so that we can run this race with purpose and intentionality. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. The Apostle Paul here is telling us the correct way to run our race. And it's not to run a race with uncertainty, but we are to run our race with purpose. It's so easy for us to get weary or to feel lost or to want to quit when you don't have a reason to continue. When you have lost sight of your purpose and the purpose for your race, you may just want to throw your hands up and say, why am I even doing this? And that is why I want us to go back. That's why I want us to look at our purpose. I want us to understand why we are running our race and why it is important for us to push forward and continue the race that God has called Mountain Grove to run. And as I said last week, God is not finished with Mountain Grove. So let's return to that purpose. Again, it states, our purpose is reaching the lost, restoring the wounded, nurturing and developing the saints. 
And as we begin today, I want to look at that second part, restoring the wounded. Now, you may be thinking, well, why don't we start with number one? And that's a good question. But my answer is, is I believe in order for Mountain Grove to fulfill the purpose, there are some wounds that need to be healed in the house. Wounds that only God can heal. But here's the good news. Our God is a healer. And our God is a God of restoration. So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles up to John 21. We're going to be in verse 14. If you don't have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to start bringing them every week. It's important that you become familiar with your own Bible. It truly is. Hebrews, I mean, uh, John chapter 21 and verse 14, the scripture says, This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Here we are presented with a conversation between Peter and Jesus. This conversation happens after Jesus is crucified and is now resurrected. The scripture states that this is the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples. But this is the first recorded conversation between Peter and Jesus since his crucifixion. The last time that we saw Peter and Jesus talking, it was the night after the Passover meal before Judas would betray him. On their way to the Mount of Olives, Jesus tells his disciples that all of them will stumble because of him that night. And the book of Luke shares this version of what Jesus had to say to Peter. Luke 22, 31 through 34 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. Jesus tells Peter and all the disciples, you're going to fall. You're going to stumble tonight. And he specifically looks at Peter and says, don't worry. Satan has asked for you. He wants to sift you. He wants to test you. But I have prayed for you that your faith would be strong and it would not fail you. And when you come back, he knew Peter would fall, but he said, when you come back to me, strengthen your brothers. And Peter, just like he had so many times before, stands and faces the Lord and he tells the Lord, listen, I will never deny you. All of these folks around me, they may give up on you, but I will never deny you. I'm ready to follow you to prison and even death. And Jesus again tells Peter, you're not only going to deny me, but before the end of this night, before the rooster crows again, you're going to deny me three times. And I can only imagine what's going through Peter's mind at this moment. We've all been there. We've been all faced with something, and we know how our heart is. We know where we stand. 
And we stand up bold and we're like, we're going to stand for this forever. There's no way I'm backing down. I'm not going to do it. I'm here. I've got my feet planted. I'm not going anywhere. And Peter's probably telling himself, there's no way I would do this to Jesus. There's no way. But Luke continues in verse 22, 54 through 62 and says, Having arrested him, Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. And now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You, are, you also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And then about an hour had passed. Another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I don't know what you are saying. And immediately... While he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and wept bitterly. I want you to come back to John 21 now. This is the first moment that we see Peter and Jesus face to face after his crucifixion. The one who had looked looked Peter right in his eyes after denying him. They were standing face to face. Surely Peter was broken in this moment.
Can y'all hear me now? Again, the definition of restoration is a person of some or return of something to a former, original, normal, or unimpaired condition. But I believe that biblical res- restoration is defined this way. When God takes something broken and he makes it brand new. The process of receiving back more than has been lost such that the final state is greater than the original condition. We may be broken, but he has plans to restore and to bring us back to something greater. In the book of Joel, we see as Israel receive a plague of locusts in their land because of their sin. But after their repentance, the Lord declares this in Joel chapter 2. In verse 25, he says, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of your Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. God is a God of restoration. And even when we think we have reached our darkest place, when we think that God has turned his face from us, We know by faith and by the scripture that he is right here with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He is waiting for us to return to him, to call out to him. And all the things that we think that we have might lost forever, in an instant, in a moment, he can return to us. All the things that sin robbed us of, he can restore all of it back. And even more. We have to remember, church, we are his workmanship. His masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Isaiah 64.8, he says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. And all we are, the work of your hand. He is the potter. We are the clay. And if we are willing to let him restore us, not only can we be made whole, but we will be back better than before. Mountain Grove, we are God's workmanship. We are his masterpiece. He has created us for good works. He is not finished with us. He is a God of restoration. He wants each one of us to be made whole he wants us to be better and stronger than we were before he wants us to know that if we call upon his name that he is right here with us he wants us to know that he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think he wants to redeem any of our lost time he wants us to know that we have seen him do mighty works in the past and that we will see him do greater works now and in the future. He wants Mountain Grove to fulfill its purpose and to be a place where all the wounded are completely restored. Let's stand. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Your word that was personified and came to life in Jesus Christ. And on this earth, he walked as a man. He pointed us back to you. But ultimately, he came to die on that cross for all of our sins. For each one of us, For those of us who may have strayed off, who may have lost sight of our purpose, who may have walked away, He is here telling us, come back. There is restoration here. There is healing here. A 
healing that was bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. We were created to do great works. Father, I just ask that you return our eyes back to you with our eyes on our purpose so that we can move forward with endurance knowing why we are running. We are running because there are people that are lost that need to know who you are. There are people that are wounded that need to be healed and restored. And we are running so that we can help one another be equipped to take this message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Holy Spirit, I ask that you just move in this room tonight. Move in each one of us. Reach down in the places that we have covered up for years. Reach down in those places and just take all of those wounds. Clean them out. And begin the process of healing on the inside of us. If there is any in here today that do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to introduce you to a God that loves you, that cares for you, that wants to restore you back to a place that is better than ever before. And if you're here and you don't know Him, please just raise your hand. Don't be shy, just raise your hand and let us know. If you're here today and you need to be restored, just repeat this prayer after me. Father God, you said that you want to restore us. And then like David in Psalm 51, we want you to restore the joy back of our salvation. Heal us. Bond us together. Bring us together back in unity so that we can reach farther and reach those that are hurting and lost and those that are far from you. as we go out this week continue to challenge us with your word and lead us and guide us to those that need you so that we can fulfill our mission and see those that are lost return to you in Jesus name If there's anybody else in this room that needs to be prayed over right now, I'm going to ask that you come down here. This gentleman right here is Floyd Richardson. Floyd and I got down on our hands and knees in the parking lot this week, and we prayed. It just so happened that I found Floyd in the parking lot. Glad I, glad I didn't drive away. This man right here is facing pancreatic cancer, though. He was on our front steps of our church praying. I asked him to come this morning so that we could pray over him. So if there's anybody else in this room that wants to come forward and be prayed over, if there's a sickness, an illness, a, a heartbreak in your life, whatever it is, you come forward, we're going to pray over you right now. We're going to do so with the Lord. Oh, let me get this up. I'd ask that everybody just reach over and take your take hands and come over here and lay hands on, the, on uh, Floyd. We are called together as elders of the church to pray over those that need our that need this healing. So, Father, we come to you right now as a church. We claim healing for Floyd. We claim his physical healing. 
we claim peace in his spirit. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you give him the strength and the courage to stand through it. And we know that this Tuesday, Floyd goes for a report. And we claim right now that when he gets there, the doctors will wonder why he's even there. They'll look at the scans. They'll look at the x-rays. And they won't even have anything to report. And we claim in that in your name, Jesus. And for anyone else who is in this room that needs healing, that needs your touch, Father, I just pray that upon them right now. Father, as we leave today, let us always be your feet, your hands, and to represent you and to preach your gospel everywhere we go. And we absolutely have to, Lord, in these words, Lord. We thank you for Floyd. We thank you for his courage. We thank you for his faith to step forward. And all of God's people said amen. 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 You're dismissed.